Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, it's Halloween. It is Halloween. So uh, n none of this is going to make any sense. I promised, I promised that I would talk about the pile and all thing. I really do not want to, but my sister insisted that I do it. So this is going to be a little weird. Um, so how is this, how is Tylenol connect, co connected to this whole concept of autism? Well, there are some studies, and th they're weird studies. Um, there, there is a study that showed that boys who were circumcised were twice as likely to be diagnosed uh, with autism later. And the reason that's important is they often use Tylenol around the circumcision, and, and so then they blame it on Tylenol. So let's, let's look at the study. There are 342,000 Danish boys who were born between 1994 and 2003, and the authors actually proposed in their study that it was pain and stress from early circumcision that might impact neurodevelopment. It did not include a discussion of painkillers that were administered to the patients, but the assumption was, since that was often used, that Tylenol was probably used. And in that study, which is often cited as an example of why Tylenol causes autism, it wasn't clear who received Tylenol. Uh, and again, and we've talked about this before, association studies never prove cause and effect. Who knows about what the parental behaviors are, healthcare access, um, cultural practice, none of that was uh, considered. And there's probably a significant bias because uh, a lot of the boys who are admitted to the hospital may have had other medical conditions. So. That, and so that you can see the data for that is <laughs> weak at best. So there's a second study that is often cited that looked at uh, perinatal analgesic exposure in autism and at a countrywide level. So they compared countrywide level uses with autism prevalence between 1984 and 2005. And again, they used male circumcision rates as a proxy for perinatal uh, uh, Tylenol exposure. The study only used population level, level data, no individual data. Um, the circumcision rates were used as a proxy, and that's been criticized by many folks as being, you know, since you don't really know if they received Tylenol. And by the way, during that time, remember that the diagnosis of autism was changing to include many other diagnoses. So over that period of time, more and more kids were being diagnosed with autism. And I showed you the study, even though there weren't, wasn't any change in behavior, there was a change in diagnostic category. So those are the studies that are used, which are pretty pathetic. Uh, there have been several meta-analyses. That's taking a bunch of observational studies and looking at them together. Uh, most studies that are lumped into these association studies are not specific about uh, uh, autism, but they, you know, the thing is acetaminophen also can be uh, a marker for th other things. So for example, uh, febrile illnesses during pe pregnancy are often uh, treated with Tylenol, but febrile illnesses themselves may cause neurodevelopment. So it's an association, but may not be a causal. And as I mentioned all along, uh, you know, from 1980, 1994, and 2013, the diagnosis of autism changed to be more inclusive, so more and more kids were being diagnosed. So, I, I mean, most of these really are totally invalid. But you could say what we need is, is a study, a really well-controlled study. Well, there has been one. There has been a large nationwide study that was published in 2024 in JAMA actually did the right thing. It used sibling analysis. So it, you know, it looked at one sibling that, was, uh, that got Tylenol versus, or during pregnancy versus sibling that didn't. Probably the best design study. That study found absolutely no association between maternal acetaminophen use and the uh, risk of autism. So uh, this is, uh, to me, it's almost like a manufactured controversy, and it's amazing to me. And apparently the state of Texas is now suing the manufacturers of Tylenol for whatever, for mislabeling. Th this, to me, is honestly just silly. And, by the way, every professional society still recommends that for febrile illnesses during pregnancy, it's perfectly uh, safe to take Tylenol. And most academic medical centers also make the same recommendations. Well, measles is back in the news. You know, I mentioned last time we talked about measles, I said we'll always have these outbreaks because we're under-vaccinated as a country, so anytime there's an exposure, there'll be an outbreak. And guess what? There's been an outbreak in northwest Arizona on the border of Utah. 120 kids, that's the second largest outbreak 
of course, Texas leads the way, 762. And so we continue to increase pretty dramatically the number of measles cases. We're up to 1,618 and, and still rising. All right. So there's been really th some interesting vaccine studies that I just want, it's just kind of amazing that I wanted to point out to you. Uh, because, uh, you know, there's all this bad things about vaccine, mRNA vaccine. Well, there's an amazing study that came out in Nature News that actually looked at uh, patients with melanoma or non-small lung cancer center actually doing better with vaccines. So why would that be? So it turns out uh, those two diseases uh, have been really transformed by the use of checkpoint inhibitors. And what are checkpoint inhibitors? When, it, when a, an inflammatory cell is turned on, a T cell is turned on, a process is stimulated at the same time to turn it off eventually, because otherwise, every time you had an inflammatory response, you'd have an autoimmune disease. So these checkpoints have been developed to stop the T cell from, from continuing to proliferate. And cancer cells have figured out a way to use that checkpoint inhib inhibition to prevent immune destruction of the cancer. So checkpoint inhibitors turn it back on and have been very effective in two very difficult to treat cancers, melanoma and small cell lung cancer. So this was a multi-center trial looking at people who receiving immune therapy, checkpoint inhibitor therapy, uh, who got vaccinated with the mRNA vaccine for COVID and, or didn't. And it turns out those that got vaccinated did better than the ones that didn't. And that was real surprising. So they actually did a study in mice, same kind of study, and the same thing happened. So why would that be? Well, we, uh, we talked about this a long time ago, but it's really interesting. Most vaccines, uh, you have the antigen that's given, uh, injected, and there's usually something that's given along with it to stimulate the immune system. Often it's aluminum, which is thought to be inert and part of many vaccines to stimulate the immune system. You don't have to do that with mRNA vaccines. Why? Because the mRNA itself stimulates the immune system through a mechanism that's very interesting. You know, we, before there were vaccines long ago, we evolved to have sort of a primordial immune response to any kind of foreign mRNA or RNA like virus that showed up. And so it's, it gets stimulated by these receptors that take a look at RNA and then stimulate it almost like an adjuvant. And so the RNA vaccines do that. And so the mRNA vaccine to COVID stimulates the immune response to help kill off these, these tumors. So really fascinating, good reason why, if you have a cancer patient, to get vaccinated. There was a recent paper published or presented by Case Western Missouri University that was also very interesting, a study of 174,000 patients uh, who were vaccinated against uh, shingles. And turns out, when they looked at it, it was people 50 and older. They filed patients for three months to seven years after their shingles vaccine, and they had a reduction of 50% of vascular dementia and cardiovascular disease by 25%. So why would a shingles vaccine be improve things like dementia and vascular disease. Well, we always, you know, when you get chicken pox, the virus goes dormant in nerve cells, and we always assume it's dormant doing nothing. But it could be that it's stimulating some sort of chronic immune response, and vaccination might help it. The mechanism isn't known, but it was interesting. Another reason why, if you're over the age of 50, get your shingles vaccine, because it helps prevent, at least in that one study, uh, cardiovascular disease and some forms of dementia. And then finally, I mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again. Uh, the, the flu season is ending in the Southern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere uh, scientists looked at what was the you know, result of the flu vaccine over this past flu season for them. And it looks like it, it's about 50% um, in reducing clinic visit and hospitalization. So that's, that's very good. If you look at RSV effectiveness, it was 95% effective in, in patients 75 and older, and 92% in patients 60 years and older. So get your RSV vaccines. You haven't had one, you only need one, and get your flu vaccine. Well, it is Halloween, and so one of the stories I've been following that I really am fascinated by is 3i Atlas. Now, 3i Atlas is a visitor from outer space. And it is, it is a really fascinating thing. Uh, and the reason I'm fascinated by it is the amount of artificial intelligence that's being used to promulgate misinformation. We've talked about this a lot, but it is really amazing for this, especially around Halloween. So uh, 3i Atlas is only the third confirmed interstellar object to pass through our solar system. The first one was uh, 2i Borisov, and of course, the next one was Oumuamua. 
And these are, these are, it is flying through, it's bound for the sun, it's going to pass right through our solar system and keep going. It's going to approach uh, the closest to, to the sun, it's called perihelion, that will be the weekend of Halloween. I mean, you can't make this up. Outer space travel <laughs> on Halloween. It's going to get to 130 million uh, miles from the sun just inside the orbit of Mars. Now, its composition is really unusual, which is why it's all, there's all this speculation. It's mostly carbon dioxide. Uh, it's like 8 to 1 ratio of di carbon dioxide to water. It's traveling faster than anything has ever been detected, 130,000 miles per hour. Uh, it's big. Some people have estimated 10 kilometers or maybe 20 kilometers the size of Manhattan. And we don't know where it came from. It came from somewhere out there. <laughs> and in fact, it came from a place where in the 70s there was a weird signal that was detected. Anyway, light bounces off it funny. So this is spec, this is yield, this is let's set all social media on fire with um, misinformation. And my favorite one that I, I actually saw and was amazed is one of my favorite uh, physicists, Michio Kaku. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole thing on him on the internet explaining why this is basically something, some outer space creature, some foreign thing by an alien and stuff, and it's all fake. It's a, but it shows you how amazing uh, AI can be, because you listen to him, you'd think he's giving a talk, but it's all fake. There have been pictures generated uh, by AI that show like a comet in the sky, which is totally made up. And there's all kinds of stuff. There's uh, synthetic uh, satellites and trajectory uh, and telescopic tra trajectories. There's networks that are that are being generated and amplifying uh, the misinformation. There are audio hoaxes. It, it's just, it's amazing. But it is fun on Halloween. It's the closest thing to an alien space thing that we've seen in a while. Anyway, it, it, it's good for Halloween. But you know, when when things are really confusing. By the way, when you get all this misinformation, there's only one thing you can do. We're sending Lily up. Lily's going to go check it out and see what it is. Well, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, I want to congratulate the many CDC experts who are being rehired after they were fired. <laughs> fired. Only in Washington can this happen. Secondly, it's time for uh, the Baylor College of Medicine Art Show. Now, this, don't forget to submit your, your favorite works of art to the Baylor Charity Art Auction. This supports the Graduate Student Council and it begins November 11th and the proceeds donated uh, will help the Texas Children's Hospital's Art and Medicine program. I, of course, have already submitted my four photographs. Be sure to bid for them. Also, good news, uh, we received the new funding for the National Institutes of Health, two consortia in the Rare Diseases Clinical Research Network. The first one is a renewal of our Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium. This is a large grant to study osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, fantastic uh, science. And then another one to look at Rare Organic Acidemia Research Consortium, uh, which is really an, another important rare disease. This is a Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital-led program. We're really excited about that. Uh, so congratulations on that team. And finally, today is Halloween. So lots of kids will be out there trick-or-treating. Lily is all excited. She is going this year as an enchanting BU cheerleader because it is their homecoming. Oh, so go Bears. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Look up at the sky and look for outer space creatures. And I can't wait to see you next week. We're right on time. Commander Lily, you doing okay? Houston, you are go for staging. Over. Stand by for both four teams. Look like everything's good. How about a bite to eat? Uh, Lily, what do you say? I'm really looking forward to it. Will someone retrieve Commander Lily? And don't forget her biscuit. Mr. Houston, you are a go for safety.